Ares, um, and, and then we'll have Hera taunting Ares and Aphrodite, and then we'll have Athena um, at line 483. Athena's heart leapt high. She charged at Aphrodite, overtook her, and beat her breast with clenched fish. Down she sank with Ares. In other words, Aphrodite runs off. Um, uh, at let's, let's Ares go, right? Two immortals spread on the earth that rears us all, with Pallas triumphing over them, winged exhaustions. Down you go. May all the gods who help the Trojans fall as hard when they battle our guys armed for war. So Athena, we're told at line 490, um, uh, 496 or so. So Athena vaunted, and now white-armed Hera smiled by the mighty god of earthquakes, challenged Phobos Apollo, right? So why hold back from each other? It's not fair when the other gods have launched themselves in war. What disgrace for us. Um, so now we've got this uh, contest between, um, suggested between uh, Poseidon and, and Apollo. What disgrace for us. Um, oh, oh, oh um, Poseidon will say, Apollo, why hold back from each other? It's not fair. When the other gods have launched themselves in war, what's disgrace for us to return without a fight to the bronze-floored house of Zeus on Mount Olympus? You lead off. You're the younger born. And I, and I, it's wrong for me, since I have years on you and know the world much better. Know the world much better is exactly what Odysseus said to Achilles, you'll remember earlier. In other words, he says, come on, let's fight, right? It will be Apollo who says, you know, uh... I, I'm not interested, right? I mean, now we can't get a sense of whether it's because he can defeat Poseidon, or you know, he knows I, I, I'm no match for you, kind of thing, uh, or I can't, I can't defeat you. But at uh, 5:25, the distant deadly archer Apollo, a volley back, god of the earthquake. Don't think me hardly sane if I fought with you for the sake of wretched mortals. I'm not fighting for wretched mortals. And then we get this amazing, and this is the genius of this poem. Right in the middle, when the poem seems to be making fun of its own self, don't take this poem too seriously. In other words. You get this amazing simile about what humans are. He says, humans are like leaves, no sooner flourishing, full of the sun's fire, feeding on earth's gifts, than they waste away and die. I, I think of Leo Viscugli as Freddy the Leaf. That, if, if you're not familiar with that book, look it up at three. It's amazing. Stop, he says, Apollo. Call off this skirmish of ours at once. Let these mortals fight themselves to death. With that, he turned and left filled with shame to grapple his own father's brother hand to hand. I'm not going to fight my uncle. But his sister Artemis, Huntress, queen of beasts, the one who, of course, although not said here, the one who told Agamemnon, you must sacrifice Iphigenia so that you can win at the walls of Troy. Go and fight. If it, um, Artemis invade against Apollo now with stinging insults, we're back to the insulting again. So, the deadly immortal archer runs for dear life, turning over victory to Poseidon, total victory, giving him all the glory here without a fight. Why do you sport that bow, you spineless fool? It's worthless as the wind. Don't let me hear you boast in Father's Hall ever again as you bragged among the gods till now that you could fight Poseidon's strength for strength. Not a word in reply to that from the archer god, but Zeus's regal consort, Hera, flew into rage at once, and her outburst raked the huntress armed with arrows. How do you have the gall, you shameless bitch, to stand and fight me here, you and your archery? Zeus made you a lion against all women, true. He let you kill off mothers in their labor, uh, Artemis is the goddess of childbirth, and obviously women often died in childbirth. But you'll find it painful matching force with me. So now you've got two two goddesses ready to go at it. Better to slaughter beasts on a rocky mountain slope and young deer in the wild than fight a higher goddess. And this young deer makes us think of all the young men that, that Achilles just took out of the river. But since you'd like a lesson in warfare, Artemis, just to learn, to savor how much stronger I am when you engage my power, she broke off. Her left hand seizing both wrists of the goddess, right hand stripping the bow and quiver off her shoulders. Hera boxed the huntress's ears. So, I mean, this becomes the height of comedy humor, right? I mean, um, Monty Python's Holy Grail has nothing on what the Iliad is doing to itself. Hera boxes the huntress's ears with her own weapons, smiling broadly now as her victim writhed away and showering arrows scattered. So we're back now to a serious scene in Book 15, line 550. When Teusus actually loses all of his arrows, right? I mean, they're at the ramparts. They're ready to get. They're ready to all get slaughtered. Here, the arrows scatter, bursting into tears. The goddess slipped from under her clutch like a wild dove that flies from a hawk's attack to a hollow cleft, rocky cleft. 
for it's not the quarry's destiny to be caught. So she fled in tears, her archery left on the spot, but Hermes, the guide of souls and giant killer, reassured his mother, Leto, nothing to fear, I'd never fight you, Leto, an uphill battle it is, trading blows with the wives of Zeus who rules the clouds. I'm not gonna mess around. <laughs> Hermes is smart, he says, I'm not gonna mess around with any wives of Zeus. No, go boast to your heart's content and tell the gods you triumphed over me with your superhuman power. So. Leto gathers the reflex bow and arrows. Again, we're back to but 15. Only there, gathering up the arrows was serious business. And bearing her daughter's archery in her arms, withdrew from the field of battle, trailing Artemis. But now, Artemis reached Olympus's heights and made her way to the bronze-floored house of Zeus, sounding very much like Aphrodite in, five, in book 5, 420, right? Line 420. Down she sat on her father's lap, a young girl sobbing her deathless robe, quivering around her body. Again, this notion of the robe comes back. We've heard it a lot. But her father, son of Kronos, hugged her tight, giving a low, warm laugh, inquired gently, Who's abused you now, dear child? Tell me, who of the sons of heaven so unfeeling cruel? Why, it's as if they had caught you in public doing something wrong. Wreathed in flowers, the one who hallows the hunt cried out at once, Artemis. Your own wife, father, the white-armed Hera beat me. This strife, this warfare plaguing all the immortals. Hera's all to blame. And now, as the powers wrangled back and forth, the Lord God Apollo entered Holy Troy, filled with dread. So in other words, we finish, right? And now we're coming to the end of the book. And of course, Apollo at Troy will set us with Achilles at Troy, which will set up a Hector and Achilles at Troy. So we are now coming to the scene. The Lord God Apollo entered, the Holy, uh, entered Holy Troy, uh, line 593, filled with dread, for the city's sturdy walls. What if the Argive forces stormed them down today against the will of fate? The rest of the gods who live forever soon return to Mount Olympus, some in rage, some in their proud, new one glory, Clavos, and set beside the father king of the black cloud. But Achilles, we're told, slaughtered on and on, never pausing, killing Trojans and skittish battle teams at once. Priam sees Achilles coming. He screams to open the gates up at line 610. Spread the gates wide, all hands now, till our routed troops can straggle back to Troy. Achilles swarms over them. They're stampeding. A terrible marauding, a, a, a terrible mauling's coming. I can see it now. Finally, right, uh, Priam sees it now. Once they're packed in the walls and catch their breath, close the thick set gates and bolt them tight again. I dread this monstrous man. He'll burst right through our walls. And... Um, Apollo then, we, were, we are told, goes to meet uh, Achilles at line 625. And then and there, the Achaeans would have taken, we're told, the lofty gates of Troy if Apollo had not driven Prince Agnar at them and to her son, a courageous, rugged soldier. He inspired his heart with daring, standing near in person to beat away the dragging fates of death, leaning against an oak concealed in swirls of mist. And so Agnar sees Achilles coming, and he has this discussion with himself to run, to escape, or to stay. And at line 650, he says it, right? Achilles is far too strong for any man on earth. Wait, he says. What if I face him out before the walls? Surely his body can be pierced by bronze, even his. He has only one life. And people say he's mortal. He's only the son of Kronos handing him, it's only the son of Kronos handing him the glory. Filled with resolve, he braced Waiting Achilles, his warrior blood incensed, he'd fight to the death. And in fact, Agnar will challenge Achilles at line 670 or so. Surely, he says, you must have hoped with all your heart, the great glorious Achilles, that you would raise the prow's Trojan city this very day. You fool. You still have plenty of pain to suffer for her sake, Troy's sake. We have fighting men by the hundreds still inside her, forming a wall before our loving parents, wives, sons to defend Troy, where you rush on to meet your doom. And of course it is true that Achilles is rushing on to meet his doom. Headlong man as you are, breakneck man of war. And he hurled his sharp spear from a strong hand, a hard hit true on Achilles' shin below the knee. But the tent of the fire new armor round his leg let loose an unearthly rain. Back the spear sprang with the wondrous gear it struck, not punching through. The gift of the god Hephaestus blocked its force. Achilles next. He leapt at Prince Agnor, but Apollo refused to let him seize the glory. So for the third time now, after Aeneas, after Hector, now Agnor, um, he whisked Agnor off, wrapped in swirls of mist, sped him out of the fighting safely on his way, and then with trickery kept Achilles 
off the Trojans. True, just like Agnar, head to foot, the deadly archer stood in Achilles' path, and Achilles sprung in chase, feet racing, coursing him far across the wheat fields, heading him out towards Scamander's whirling depths as the god led him a little, luring him on and on, um, we, right? We think about um, in, in comedy, Midsummer Night's Dream, when uh, Puck does the same thing in the woods, right? T um, taking the two young men all the way through the woods, right? To kind of, to kind of um, try and, and, and Lysander, where are you, where are you, I'll, I'll kill you and all of that, right? Always hoping to catch the god with bursts of speeds, but all the while, the rest of the Trojans fled in mass, thrilled to reach the ramparts. The symbolism of Troy as a, as, a, as a refuge is obvious. Crowding, swarming in, no daring left to remain outside the city walls and wait for each other. Learn who made it through, who died in battle. No, in a driving route they came, streaming into Troy. Any fighter whose racing legs could save his life. And of course... We're going to set up then the conversation of Hector. Do I go into the city with the rest of the Trojans and save my life? Or do I stay and do I fight? All right, let's quickly work at level 2 and 3. At 2A, well, obviously fighting can be serious, but it can also be silly business. And I think, it's, um, I think that's the point here. Maybe it's all senseless, right? Um, another major theme here. Sometimes carnage, uh, sometimes courage is not enough, right? Um, like Aeon. Um, is an example. Sometimes courage is enough. Agnor is, is an example, right? Um, and then the idea, there's no stopping the fire um, 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 without the water. So you have this tension, right, between the... Think about how the um, Taoist symbol of the yin-yang works here, where fire and water are kind of set up and just opposed against each other. At level 2B, well, we got several symbols here. Lycaon obviously can represent really, really bad luck, or it can represent fate, destiny. Troy obviously can represent a city of refuge. The irony, of course, in this passage is that the gods are silly, right? And Zeus will laugh. And the obvious question is, how can we take this text seriously? Do we see it as tragedy? Do we see it as comedy? I think this is why the, the Iliad still remains a classic text, because it is in some ways both, isn't it? That is to say... It's life. Sometimes it's tragic, sometimes it's comic, right? At 3A, um, well, obviously the question, are we making fun here of all of the early books of the Iliad, lines one, or books 1 through 20, right? And to what degree are we kind of making fun? Um, I'd like to think, um, you know, I was once asked, uh, what was uh, Queen Elizabeth's view on men? And I said, I imagined after her study of the Iliad, it would be something like this. Why would I attach myself to men? What are men good for? They run around with their little body parts, sticking them where they don't belong and causing great big wars. I've, I've used the line before when I, when I talk about Queen Elizabeth. Certainly, that's kind of the, the, the project of the Iliad, right? And yet, there's a seriousness to all of this as well, obviously, that's brilliant. I think of Cormac McCarthy, two of his classic novels, No Country for Old Men. Do you remember that quarter scene? Um, think of Lycaon and the fact that he traveled all the way around to come back to this moment in time. And 12 days he's only been back home and now he's going to get jacked by Achilles. Think about that quarter scene in No Country for Old Men. Um, and in some ways you can think of No Country for Old Men as kind of a response to the great epic of, the, many have argued, the 20th century um, in uh, Blood Meridian which is in many ways kind of a tribute by Cormac McCarthy to the Iliad. If you're not familiar with uh, Blood Meridian, I definitely recommend that you take a look at it. I'll, I'll be giving a lecture on Blood Meridian later. Um, what is your favorite mock of the Iliad movie? Some of you will think of Monty Python's Holy Grail. Do you play a game that comes to mind that kind of makes fun of this whole thing? Level 3B. Are you insulted by these activities of the gods, or does it make the Iliad more entertaining for you? How about this one? And this is uh, the, the great church father, Tertullian, said, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? And by that, what he meant was Christians should not think at all or worry at all about Greek mythology. Well, Augustine, the, the greatest saint of the Christian church, he was aware of the challenge of the question we're about to ask. Is it a good idea to conceive of the gods anthropomorphically in human, in human form, right? So, for example, Augustine is going to see this and ridicule this view of the gods, and yet he will take very seriously the idea of the exchange in the book of Job, the 38th chapter, when God out of the whirlwind speaks with Job. That is serious business. 
here, this is silly business. Or think, for example, for, for readers of the Bhagavad Gita, that you have an anthropomorphic view of Krishna there on the battlefield trying to convince Arjuna to go off and fight in the war, right, in the battle. Is it a good idea or a bad idea to see gods in anthropomorphic ways? Does anthropomorphic views of God make them more or less accessible and are they worthy of reference? Certainly, Socrates had some serious reservations about that idea. Where do you come down on that? What was the time, how about this one? What was the time you acted silly, but at the time you were serious? Only after the fact do you see it as kind of silly, and, and now you laugh at yourself. Well, all of this silliness, if we can call it that, leads us now to book 22, and we come, of course, to the most tragic. If it's comic before, and Maybe there is some comic relief getting ready for this book 22, which is anything but comic um, of the Iliad book 22, right? We will watch Hector go down and know that soon Troy will go down. It is sad, but of course we're going to, we're going to watch every bit of it. Thank you.